Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadee Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program, and on Wednesdays, we come together in order to do meditation together. I've been teaching this four-part series of breathing mindfulness meditation, where I'm gradually teaching you and helping you build up your meditation practice. And over the last couple of Wednesdays, we've been coming together to encourage, support, and motivate each other in our meditation practice while opening up to any and all questions that you guys might have related to your meditation practice of breathing mindfulness mindfulness meditation. On the very first class of this series, I taught breathing mindfulness meditation, and now we've just been practicing in each class and opening up to any questions that you guys might have. So we're going to be doing that today where we'll start with a breathing mindfulness meditation session and then open up to any and all questions that you guys might have related to breathing mindfulness meditation or anything else that you might have questions about related to the path to enlightenment. Next week, I'm going to be starting with a four-part series on loving-kindness meditation and helping you to understand how to practice loving-kindness meditation and helping you to understand why we actually practice it and what it's actually transforming in the mind. And we'll do four individual sessions of that over the course of four different Wednesdays. And then we'll be starting with the chanting series of four individual classes related to Buddhist chanting. So I'd like to welcome all of you guys for our fourth and final class related to breathing mindfulness meditation before we move into other series. And then once we're done with the loving kindness meditation in the Buddhist chanting series, we'll actually be rotating breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation every week. We'll be rotating those back and forth to help you continue to build up your practice. But these first three months of the group learning program is all about helping you to build up your breathing mindfulness meditation practice, your loving kindness meditation practice, your chanting practice. And then of course, on the Sundays, we're going through the path to enlightenment and ultimately we're going to be starting each individual chapter of this book developing a life practice the path that leads to enlightenment volume one so if you guys would like to join for meditation you can go ahead and take a comfortable meditation position either on the floor or in a chair if you're on a floor you might end up putting a cushion under your rear, getting your rear up in the air. This lessens the angle at your hips, your knees, and your ankles. And then this can help you to be more comfortable. If you're in a chair, you might just have your feet flat on the floor or cross at the ankles. It's really up to you. There's no one set way to do this. You would like the body to be comfortable, not luxurious and not painful, but comfortable. And then with the hands and arms, the hands and arms, you would like those to rest comfortably in the lap. The Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together, and then he put that into his lap. And if that's comfortable for you, you could use that. But other options are placing your palms on your thighs, your knees, palms face up. Some people might even put their arms on the armrest of a chair if they're in the chair. So your lower body and hands and arms should be completely relaxed, with the upper body being erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation session. So next, just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just looking to establish the breath of breathing in and out. I'm going to ease us into meditation with some chanting, and then I'll be back with some more guidance to help ease us further into meditation. Arahang Samma Sammoto Makewa Potang Makewa 
Vannang Apivate Yami Savakato Makavata Tammo Dhamang Namasami Supadipano Makavato Savaka Sankho Sankhang Namami Napmora Sapakavato Arato Summa Samputasa Nap more sa pakawato Arato summa saputasa Nap more sa pakawato Arato summa saputasa Iti piso makawa arahang sama sa moto wicara nang sa mono sekatoro kawito. Anu tero puri sa dama sati sata tawa manu senang puto pakewati. Okay, you should be breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just establishing the breath. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. Your breath isn't going to necessarily match up to the guidance that I provide. I'm here just as guidance. This is your practice to work on gradually breathing in through the nose, establishing a nice natural breath. You're not interested in controlling the breath or forcing it. Experiencing the full inhale. And then when you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Experiencing the full exhale. A nice natural breath. Breathing in. In, out. Breathing in. In, out. Once the breath is established, start fixating the mind on the breath. The sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving into the nose. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and 
in, out. Breathing in. In, out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you observe that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Wherever you observe that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in, in, out. Breathing in, in, out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in, in, out.
to gradually make your way out of meditation. I'm going to be opening up for any questions that you guys might have related to meditation or anything related to the path to enlightenment. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. In the comment section, I'll be able to see those and be sure your question gets answered during the class. Or in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically and ask any questions that you would like to ask. As you're potentially considering asking a question, let me just remind you of a few things now that this is our last class in this particular series of breathing mindfulness meditation. It's important to remember that the goal of this meditation isn't to eliminate thoughts. What you're doing is you're arising the wholesome quality of mindfulness or awareness of mind, the wholesome quality of concentration, being able to focus on a fixed object and practice singleness of mind, and you're working to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. The primary problem that the Buddha discovered that's causing the discontentedness in the mind is craving, desire, attachment. The mind is holding on, it's craving permanence. It doesn't want to let go. So what you're training is to train the mind to let go, to let go, to let go, to easily let go so that you're able to build this over a long-term period of time that the mind's easily able to let go and it's not holding on so tightly. It's comfortable with impermanence. So that's what you're doing as part of this meditation. Arising mindfulness, concentration, and training the mind to let go, now you move these qualities into daily life through practicing the Eightfold Path and all the steps on the Eightfold Path. And now these two things combine of practicing meditation and practicing all the steps on the Eightfold Path, you're going to start experiencing the mind gradually awakening where you'll notice the diminishing of discontentedness as you progress forward. You would like to 
get to the point where you build up this practice to two or three meditation sessions per day for 30 minutes or more. It's gonna take you time to build that up and create some space in your life, but wherever you are, that's where you are. If it's once a day for five minutes, then okay, that's where you're at. If it's twice a day for 15 minutes, then okay, then you know that's where you're at right now. So just gradually work on expanding that to get to about two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more. This is where you'll actually see the most benefits but typically we don't necessarily have that kind of time in our life when we first get started. We tend to be really busy with a lot of other things that we're doing when we first join this path. And then as you reduce your craving little by little, you'll start noticing that you'll end up having more time because you won't necessarily be pursuing certain cravings and things like this. And as you start seeing the benefits in the meditation, you'll have a tendency to practice more regularly because you'll have seen the benefits. Much like when you were young and you didn't necessarily take a shower or brush your teeth or things like this, you needed people to remind you, like your parents, to remind you to do those things. Well, once you see enough benefit in the taking a shower and brushing your teeth, then you got to a point where you saw the benefits and you decided that this was something you would like to do on a regular basis because you see those benefits. And the same thing with meditation is as you're practicing it regularly and you start seeing the mind becoming more stilled and more quieted in meditation, but also outside of meditation, you'll have more of a tendency to practice. You'll notice some small incremental changes as you go, but it's usually you know much later, three months, six months, a year, that you really start noticing more and more significant benefits because you're accumulating the benefits of this meditation as you go. So you shouldn't expect immediate results, but at the same time, it's not abnormal to see, even in a couple of days, things improving in the mind. The mind becoming more still, more quieted, as you progress in your meditation practice and practicing the Eightfold Path, this will only enhance. But an enlightened being will actually still experience an occasional thought in meditation. So that's why I share with you, the goal isn't to eliminate thoughts. As long as you are alive, you're gonna have thoughts in the mind. So as you have those thoughts, you'd like to know that you're having them sooner and sooner and be able to cut them off and let them go easier and easier. And then as you do that, and you're practicing the rest of the Eightfold Path, you'll see this longer and longer period of time in your meditation where the mind is quieted and stilled. So this is where you'll start seeing those results. So let me see what questions you guys have. Again, you can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Looks like JP has a question here. Is it common to experience headaches during meditation? It's not necessarily common, but it's not abnormal either. What's transpiring as you're training the mind is you're training the mind and eliminating pollution, and there's a connection to the brain. The brain is the physical organ in the body where the mind is intangible. It's not tangible, it's not physical, but there's a connection between the two of them. And as you're training the mind, there's physical changes that are happening to the brain. And you can experience sometimes a little bit of a headache or even something more than that. You can sometimes even hear the changes happening in the brain. But as you move through your practice and you develop your practice more and more and the mind awakens with less and less pollution in the mind and these changes are taking effect in the brain, you'll have less and less headaches and eventually you get to the point where you can go really long periods of time inside meditation, outside of meditation with no headaches whatsoever. It's not that the meditation is necessarily producing the headache, it's that the meditation is reducing and eliminating the pollution of mind, which then is going to produce changes in the brain and now as the brain's changing, those changes need to take place and now that's where the headaches are coming from. At one time in my life, I used to experience all kinds of migraines, even to the point of vomiting, a very significant, significant headaches. And then as I started training the mind in the Buddhist teachings, now I very rarely ever get a headache. The only time I really get a headache is maybe if I've eaten something that I didn't realize that I ate, like something like MSG or something like that, or maybe if I, I haven't had enough water in a particular day, there might be a little bit of a headache, but it's very minimal. A little bit of water, it'll take care of it. Sometimes even just putting pressure on the head in different places, it'll take care of it. Where before, you know, I would really be affected by these migraine headaches. And this is indicative of a mind that's heavily polluted 
experiencing those significant headaches. That's the body telling the mind like, hey, something's wrong here because during those times, my mind was very heavily polluted. And as the pollution was lifting, then I experienced less and less headaches to the point now where I very rarely ever experience one. And if I do, it's very light, very minimal. And it's usually from something like not drinking enough water or perhaps ingesting a little MSG or something like this. So thank you for that question. I don't see any other questions on Zoom, but let's see what YouTube has. How many hours weekly need to meditate? So I usually look at a daily practice because that's what you would like to do is build up your daily practice where you're meditating two or three times a day for 30 minutes or more. So that's somewhere between an hour and an hour and a half is what you'd like to build up to. But very rarely does anybody ever start there. You know, some people even start with just one minute or five minutes a day. So rather than think about it in a weekly terms, I usually think about it on a daily basis because if you multiplied, let's say, make it easy one hour by seven days, that's seven hours a week. If you thought about it on a weekly basis, and let's just say you didn't meditate for four, five, six days, and then on the sixth and seventh day, you tried to fit in seven hours, this isn't the best way to manage your meditation practice and really see the most transformation of the mind. You would like to have a daily, consistent, ongoing meditation practice. So looking at it on a day-by-day basis is best. And realize that sometimes you're going to miss a day, particularly when you are building up your practice. Eventually, you'll get to a point where again, you'll see so many benefits that you won't miss meditation. It'll just be so consistent and so regular that you'll just always be meditating throughout your days. But I encourage you to look at it on a daily basis of two to three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more. That's what would produce the best results. Let's see. I don't see any other questions on YouTube or Facebook. And let's see, we have a question coming in on Zoom. It says, how can enlightenment permanent without any regression? Okay, so once the mind is trained to enlightenment, you've unconditioned the mind. You've eliminated all the pollutions of mind. The reason why the mind is experiencing the discontent feelings like conditioned pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant is because there's conditions in the mind that are causing these discontent feelings to arise namely craving, anger, and ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. But focusing on craving for a moment, that mental longing and strong eagerness, that's what's producing those discontent feelings. So those are the conditions in the mind that are now causing the mind to be shaken up and unsteady and uncalm. The mind is basing its inner feelings on some impermanent condition. So therefore it gets these temporary pleasant feelings, it gets these temporary painful feelings, and it gets these neither painful nor pleasant feelings. An enlightened mind has removed those conditions. There's no longer any craving, anger, or ignorance in the mind. It's been completely eradicated. The pollution's completely gone. So therefore the mind is now unconditioned. A conditioned object, like a conditioned feeling, it's going to arise, it's going to change, and it's going to fade away because you're basing the mind on some condition. Let me just give a simple example. If your mind is happy and excited because it's sunny outside, now you're basing your inner feeling of happiness on the condition of being sunny. But since the sun is not permanent, that feeling of happiness, excitement is not permanent either. So it's only a matter of time before the weather changes, which means now your feelings are going to change as well. Now going to be frustrated or angry or annoyed or sad or some other discontent feeling. An enlightened mind being unconditioned, it doesn't have those pollutions of mind. It doesn't base its inner feelings on some condition. So therefore, if it's sunny outside, an enlightened mind is going to be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. Not because it's sunny, but it's already peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy as unconditioned. There's no condition that needs to be in existence in order for the mind to be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because the mind is now unconditioned. 
And now if it's raining outside, an enlightened mind is still peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because there's no conditions in the mind. It's unconditioned. So it's been trained to no longer base its inner feelings on some impermanent condition, like in this example, the weather. But there's multiple conditions that the unenlightened mind is going to base its inner feelings on. And until it's fully purified of all these conditions, namely craving, anger, and ignorance, but in more detail, the 10 fetters, which is what we're going to be talking about this Sunday. When all of those pollutions are eradicated from the mind, the mind's now purified, it's now unconditioned, and it will no longer go up and down and up and down because of some condition. Instead, it'll just be peaceful and joyful all the time. And that's why it's permanent, because a unconditioned object, it does not arise, it does not change, and it doesn't fade away. The enlightened mental qualities are just always there. It's like a light bulb that's just always on. Before I end our class, I see that there is a hand in Zoom. So let me just turn over to Joe. If you would like to unmute and ask your question, we'll go ahead and go from there. Hi, TJ. Um, my question is, I guess the more you practice and the more you move along the path, um, living in the U.S. especially, I feel like I may become more isolated from the people around. You know, I guess there aren't exactly a lot of Buddhists walking around Arizona. Um, so I guess, I don't know, is that a problem you've run into or people run into where they feel or fear they may become more alone or you know, even from your family um, because you're essentially doing this alone um, well, with you guys, but alone in my world. Yeah, so so this is kind of common that there's two aspects to this question. This is kind of common that when you are on this path, if you're doing it alone without your family, without other friends or people around you, then if your mind is craving or longing or yearning for others to do this with you, then you can feel lonely. The loneliness is being produced by the craving of wanting others to be able to do it with you. So that's the first part, that if there's any loneliness at all, it's the the mind holding on, wanting people to do this training in this path with you. The second part of this is, is that as somebody starts training, oftentimes their life kind of comes down and kind of consolidates where they're not necessarily spending as much time doing all the things that they used to do or spend time with the same people that they used to spend time with. Because in the past, we were making certain decisions based on our cravings, based on certain central pleasures that we were chasing. And as we remove our cravings, desires, attachments, our life kind of becomes more consolidated. And then as we do this work and we work on our own mind, then it kind of expands back out. The way that I think about it is like a bow tie, that when we were younger, our life was like wide open. We weren't really understanding any particular wisdom of who to choose to be in our life and who to be around and things like this. So our life was just wide open, you know, it was kind of unfiltered, untethered to anything. And then as we aged, even before getting onto this path, people that we spent time with kind of decreased slowly but surely. And it kind of comes into the knot of the bow tie. And now this is where like we do this work to train the mind and we really focus inwardly, not so much on who's around us and what's going on around us necessarily with having a a big list of friends and social activities and going out and partying and all the things that we might have used to have done in the past. So we do this work on our own mind. And then once we do and we create that transformation, then we expand back out and we start meeting all these new people and we're not shy anymore. We're not self-conscious anymore. We don't have a lack of self-esteem necessarily. There's, as you expand back out with the mind being more trained, now you're creating relationships both personally and professionally based on wise decisions that we know that will be wholesome for us in terms of the natural law of gamma. And now we kind of build up our life slowly but surely into this more stable, more steady life where the people that we choose to spend time with are into wholesome things, where in the past, maybe we didn't necessarily make those same decisions because we were making decisions based on central desire and our central pleasures that we were chasing. So this is common that if the mind's holding on to previous relationships 
and you're starting to consolidate down into the middle, that you can feel a bit lonely, but that loneliness is coming from the cravings, desires, attachments. If you don't let those go, then the mind's going to continue to feel lonely. So it might take you some time to let that go. But once you do, then the liberation or the freedom of those strong feelings is waiting on the other side. And now you expand back out and you start making relationships and other venues and other situations and other environments that you weren't necessarily in before. Okay. Thank you. That helps. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Just seeing some comments of thank you. And I don't see any other questions or comments. So what I'll do then is just remind you guys about what classes are coming up next. This Sunday, we're going to be covering the last class of our kind of preview of the beginning of the path to enlightenment before we end up starting chapter one. Two Sundays from now, we're gonna be starting chapter one of this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment, volume one. But this Sunday, we're gonna be studying a segment of chapter three, which is all about the four stages of enlightenment and the 10 fetters. Because so far I've walked students through building up their practice of the Eightfold Path and moving into the jhanas and kind of explain what that's all about and what's going to be experienced. And then from there, I talked about focusing on the 10 fetters and moving into the four stages of enlightenment. So that's what we're gonna be discussing this Sunday. Next Wednesday, we're gonna be discussing loving kindness meditation. I'm gonna be teaching you guys what that is and how to actually do it. So you'll be able to start that four part series either live or through the replay of learning loving kindness meditation and why you should actually be practicing this and what it's actually transforming. So I'll see you guys in one of these future classes. In the meantime, as you need help, feel free to reach out either through the Facebook post through asking questions in class, through sending a private message or scheduling a personal guidance session. I'll see you guys in one of these future classes. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.